It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. All right, everyone. Welcome back. This is episode number 43, Beneath the Helmet, season two. So today I got a chance to sit down with the president of Yoga Shield for first responders which is an organization bringing yoga to the fire service. Uh, there's lots of interest in this lately. I know several people whose niche is in yoga for first responders, and I think it's very fitting. We're going to talk a lot about uh, how yoga can be brought into your life in a proactive way for your own mental health. We're going to talk about the challenges around yoga and what that means in dispelling some myths, some myths around you know, that you have to wear Lululemon tight yoga pants to do yoga. Uh, that yoga is only for women. That's totally false as well. That yoga is, you have to do that in a yoga studio with uh, essential oils and all these different things. And, and no, that's not true. We can do yoga as well as that. That's definitely an option. But we can also do yoga in a much more um, first spotter friendly environment. So today I get a chance to sit down with the president, Eric Brenneman, and he's going to share a little bit about his journey from being a uh, former firefighter and now president uh, with his partner, Yoga Shield for First Responders. We're going to dive into some knowledge around breathing, some tactical exercises there. We're going to talk about the, the differences between TRE, which is something I'm very passionate about, which is tension trauma release exercises, and how it's very, very similar to yoga, in fact and how the body stores trauma and how we can release it through some somatic work. So this is definitely going to be an interesting episode. If you're curious about yoga and how it might fit into your life, this is probably an episode you want to dive into for sure. Sit back, relax, do some stretches. And until next time, stay well. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, season two. Can you believe it? Season two. I have a brand new friend who uh, down in states here who's from yoga shield yoga for first responders today i got eric brenman on the line today so welcome to the show eric hey thanks chief appreciate being here am i the awesome. first guest on episode of season two uh you won't be the first oh, but you're first okay. recorded um, yeah i love yes. it that's cool <laughs> season two yes. congratulations yes. on having multiple seasons chief i mean that's a big accomplishment so well done i appreciate that yeah it's it's been an amazing journey and uh i'm slightly addicted to podcasting now which is which is kind of fun <laughs> yeah no that's awesome it's a as we were talking it's a great connector it's a great way to meet it people is. share like interests and you get to have an impact in the world that you never even realize you're going to have uh with the people that just listen to the show from all over uh, from all different walks of life so excited to be here chief well happy to have you so as the president of uh yoga shield yoga for first spotters um Eric's going to share a bit about his story. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about who Eric is and yeah. what brought you to where you are today? Totally. Yeah. So uh, my name is Eric. I'm a former firefighter, actually. Uh, I have 13 years on the job uh, in the Midwest. Uh, left the job actually at the top of my game. I was company officer. You know, you get to that 10, 12, 13 years in and you're starting to finally figure out the job a little bit. You're like, oh, I've kind of got this figured out. Things are starting to slow down a little bit. But I had always worked my career from a, honestly, taking care of my fellow firefighters. So got hired very, very young. Um, first day off probation, basically, got voted into an executive leadership position on our labor association and worked from the health and wellness side on, on, with the IFF uh, across the state of Iowa. And it was very driven by that mental health aspect of, of the fire service. Um, then ended up getting promoted up to company officer. Uh, that's a very important position to make sure you're taking care of your crew. Uh, you're the first stop to make sure they go home uh, at the end of the day. And so, again, just watching out for my crews as they're coming into shift and seeing what they're dealing with and that kind of stuff is very important to me. And so uh, I had never done yoga a day in my life. Uh, quite frankly, had every miscon pre preconceived misconception that there was out there that it was for ladies and yoga pants and lattes and all that stuff and it's not for me it's not for a firefighter 
Uh, but our training chief actually brought in the founder of Yoga for First Responders, uh, Olivia, uh, on a mandated basis. He saw that we were having some mental health issues start to pop up. He saw that we were starting to have some physical issues pop up as our workforce started to age up a little bit. And so he brought uh, Yoga for First Responders in and literally committed to it so much that he took off one of our days of training out of our tour and plugged mandated yoga in in mm -hmm. place of it. Um, and it takes that kind of, I'll be honest, takes that kind of leadership to make a program like this effective uh, in public safety. Um, and so through that time, got to know Olivia a little bit uh, better. She and I are now married, uh, full disclosure. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I'm now uh, working as the president of Yoga for First Responders in conjunction with Olivia, uh, going around the country uh, teaching. Um, our public safety personnel, this super important tool um, for proactive mental health. I think that's a really, really important part of it because I was on my peer support team. I loved being on the peer support team, uh, but even the best peer support team across the country is still for most uh, purposes reactive. We wait for our membership to get jammed up, whether it's through um, alcohol abuse or marriage issues or anything like that. And then they come to peer support for help or, and then we can kind of refer them out to resources around the community. Um, there are a few very good proactive um, peer support teams out there, but all in all, they're mostly reactive. And so I really wanted to see if we could shift that needle and move the needle a little bit upstream uh, when it comes to helping our membership out with, from a mental health wellness standpoint. And so here I am, I've uh, been off the truck now about, man, Yesterday, yesterday would have been my last shift six years ago, wow. actually. Time, how fast time goes. So and how much do you miss it? Or do you, are you happy where you are? Yeah. So that's a really, really good question. So uh, because I left at the top of the game, I mean, we, one of the things that I get very passionate about is the singular identity of people in the fire service. I am a firefighter, right? We say that over and over and over again, and we wear that badge proudly as we should. Uh, and it took uh, probably about four to four and a half years before I was finally comfortable with the decision of leaving the job. And every time I saw a truck drive by, I mean, I moved away. I'm in a different state than where I was in, in service at. And every time you see a rig rolling down the road, you just be like, man, I could be on that truck. Like I could be doing that. That's what I should be doing, you know? Um, and so it took four to four and a half years of dealing with it before I finally was at peace uh, with that decision. And so I'm very passionate now, uh, talking to firefighters uh, about this, especially if they're getting closer to the end of their career, or even at the very beginning of it, of you are more than a firefighter. Uh, you are so much more than that. And you have to start to identify yourself as more than the firefighter, because if you leave on your own choice, like I did, or you're forced off because of an injury or whatever it is, um, we see a lot of issues with our retirees and folks that step off that truck. Um, and that's very concerning to me. And so it's something I really try to address uh, in conjunction with what I do um, to help people realize that they're more than a firefighter. Um, super important. So true. Yeah, I would say I was put in that camp as well where I was a firefighter who was who I was. Fire chief was who I was. Yeah. And uh, through this whole journey of kind of recovery from burnout, I've really realized that I'm a father, I am a, a, a husband, all these different things. I'm a friend, I'm a person, I'm a coach, I'm all these different things now that right. I never never thought was going to be me. I thought I was going to be a fire chief for, for life, right? Yeah, totally. And it really messes with your mental health if you don't have some sort of open mindset about uh, other things than fire, right? So. Correct. Yeah. yeah, so one of the exercises that I really like to take people through, and we actually take people through when they come through our instructor school, our Train the Trainer program at Yoga First Responders, is a personal mission statement. Hmm. And I cannot do anything with your public safety career. Build a new personal mission statement. Because so often, um, the labels that we get put on us are put on us from a young age by our parents. Uh, it's where it starts. And then we kind of adopt those and take those on. And from our educators and our peers and our teachers, and then we take them on from our career. And so it takes some concerted, conscious effort to sit down and be like, who am I? Who is Eric, right? And so I challenge all the listeners to the show. This is a new take on all the podcasts I've ever done, Chief. And 
take a moment to actually sit down and work through building a personal mission statement. It has nothing to do with your public safety career. And there's plenty of tools out there on the internet that you can find of like, how do I build a personal mission statement? And you can work through these exercises. Most of them only take 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, if you want, you can go a little bit longer, but just take those 10 minutes, 15 minutes and really sit down for, take a Saturday morning. I mean, heck, we're come, take a weekend and sit and be like, who am I today? And then revisit it because it's going to change, right? Like I just became a dad. I, just, I have a 13 month old kid. Being a father was something I always aspired to be. Uh, but now that I have a kid, like that changes my identity. It changes some priorities in life. And so you do have to revisit that personal mission statement. Um, I would suggest on a yearly basis, but try that, folks. Like Beautiful. start there. Start with who you are. Well, it could be a perfect uh, New Year's resolution as well, right? Instead of resolutions, yeah. throw that out the window. And right. Develop, develop a personal mission statement for that year, maybe even. Oh. Yes, Exactly. And it's different than goal setting because then what I really like about personal mission statement in this practice is, is that that becomes your filter for everything else in life. So as decisions come at you uh, in the new year, you can filter them through your personal mission statement. And if they aren't in alignment with that statement, then I hate to break it to you folks, but the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> the, and we in public safety saying no is really hard, especially if somebody's asking for our help and we're like, oh, I should really help them, but it's not quite in alignment with who I am or what I want to do, or it's going to take me away from something that's really important to me. We're still the types of people that will typically say yes. Then all of a sudden we're doing all of these crazy things. We're like, what about, what about me? And when it goes to talking about burnout and talking about our mental health and wellness, that word no uh, can be a really, really powerful word. Uh, so make sure that the things you're doing are in line with that personal mission statement. And if they're not, say no. Like try to cut some things out of your life. It just may change your life. Yep. Love it. Love it. Do you mind sharing yeah. your own personal mission statement? Is that something no. you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, that's a, that's a private really thing. Important. No, it's not even no. a private thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at this point, um, I would say that my personal mission statement uh, at, is first and foremost to put myself in a health and wellness spot so I can be there for my family. Um, for too far too long, I've put other priorities above my family. I am a victim of the fire service. I am uh, unfortunately divorced um, and remarried, but happily remarried with a kid. Um, but for far too long, put the union, put the overtime, put the work, put the job and everything else um, above my family, quite frankly. Um, and then when some personal issues popped up, saw how those cracks then became crem like big crevices uh, in the relationship. And so um, first and foremost is put, uh, it sounds selfish, but it's okay to be selfish when it's about putting yourself first. And it's, so it's about putting myself, and my personal mission statement would be to put myself, my health and wellness in as a priority so that I can maintain the proper family relationships. Because um, at the end of the day, my wife and my little girl, that's all I've got. If I, I work full-time job outside of yoga for first responders and um, there's a saying that I really believe in too, um, that if I were to die tomorrow, they'd have my job filled next week. I'm, I'm replaceable, you know, uh, and but I'm not replaceable to uh, my wife and I'm not replaceable to my, to my daughter. And so to be there for them, that's, that's what I'm living for these days. And I've never lived for those folks before. And it's really, really powerful and super cool but it also makes me say no to a lot of things. And you realize how quickly uh, you're out of alignment when you put those things as priority. So, um, and then the second part of it is, is to continue to be in service of others. Uh, that has always been a passion of mine. It's been a passion of most people in public safety. And so now I'm just on the other side of the, of the stripe, so to speak. So um, while they're going out the door to serve the public, I'm getting to stand behind them and make sure that I'm serving them, meaning the firefighters and the law enforcement folks that we work with to make sure they're the best version of themselves so they can go and serve their communities. And honestly, what I've heard more importantly is be of service to their families as well. Um, if we can, I, this is going to get a little bit personal. I was talking with a, a cop who went through one of our research studies that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and when I was doing the interview portion with him at the end uh, of the study, he said, you know, it's funny, Eric, because he said, I thought, this is all going to be for me. And he said, and it was. But my wife has told me I'm a better husband. My kids have told me I'm a better dad. 
because of the work that I'm doing at work through yoga first responders by doing a yoga class a week, um, by taking care of my mental health and wellness at work, it's turned me into that better husband and that better dad. And that's powerful. That's where we should be working. Yeah. Let's be honest. That's where we should be working. Um, and it's the citizenry is important. It's always important to take care of your citizens. They're the ones that we have got hired to take care of. But if we can fortify our relationships at home um, by taking better care of ourselves, it's okay to be selfish in that moment. I agree. Um, I agree hundred percent. Yeah. So, and that's hard chief. I mean, that's hard for people if you're out there listening to this podcast. I would venture to guess most of them are going to be like, cause I just got called out on this literally a month ago or so by, by my wife. She, I was watching a bunch of people uh, cycling along the side of the road as we were coming back from the mountains. And I was like, man, I don't even have time to get out on my bike anymore. And she's like, why not? And I said, because I'm working all the time, because I want to be with you. I want to be with Aurelia. Like, I don't have time to get out there. And she's like, Eric, you have to be selfish with your time once in a while to make sure that you're in the best spot to go so you can be the best dad for us. And so even the guy that says this and talks this and teaches this has to be called out on it once in a while. And so I'm, I can only guarantee that some folks listening to this, when I say be selfish and do something for yourself from a health and wellness standpoint, that's going to, the hair on the back of their neck is going to stand up a little bit because that's not who we're programmed to be. Uh, when we work in public safety. I'd say it's a pretty consistent message across all the guests that I have on this show is yeah. that self-care is number one and it is not selfish. It is taking care of yourself. And for myself, I truly feel that, you know, we were servants to the public as firefighters or mm -hmm. first responders or police officers, whatever that looks like. Yeah. But we can't be the best professional showing up if we're hurting at home, if we're hurting financially, if we're hurting physically, mentally. It's just not going to happen. No. So if we no, want to be the best high performing yes. uh, public servant, we got to take ourselves number one, hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. It's an analogy I use all the time. I mean, uh, you look at a lot of people can correlate with like professional athletes. They see that they see those folks as the elite high performing, uh, high performer in society, whether you like it or not, they, they just look at them and say, well, these guys perform optimally at their best. But if you look at professional athlete schedules, 95% of it is actually downtime and recovery. Like if you start to follow uh, these guys closely, a lot of the work, the practices are two hours a day, Monday, basically Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for football, right? And one of those is probably a walkthrough. And then they're playing for three hours on Sunday afternoon. Uh, other than that, it's taking care of their body, taking care of their, their uh, physical health, taking care of their nutritional health. Uh, it's all about that recovery and taking care of their own mind and body so they can be there to perform optimally when they need to. It's, 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 everybody thinks it's all about the performance. Turns out it's actually more about the recovery than it is about performance. And so, uh, one of the cool things about yoga that misconception about yoga is, uh, that it is for the ladies and it is for down regulation. Uh, we actually work, uh, through yoga for first responders a lot on job performance and job enhancement on that side of it through different kinds of techniques. And one of the things about yoga is that it uh, has been shown to help us activate the flow state. Yeah. So the flow state is like when we're in the zone, when we're in the pocket, when things are going exactly right, um, we think of, um, again, a basketball player making 30 free throws in a row. They're in the zone. They're, in, they're just in that flow of things. And for firefighters, we can get into the zone sometimes when the tones go off, it drives us into that present moment and we can dive into, into there and everything else seems to fade away. We no longer, uh, my example of this is, is when the bell rings at 3.30 in the morning and all of a sudden it's a, it's a working structure fire and you realize like, you don't even think that you have to go to the bathroom. Like shit, that, that, that sense of self, like it's that primal sense of self, but, but it goes away uh, because you are starting to focus and getting into that zone state. And so one of the preeminent researchers of this state of flow uh, recently passed away. His name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi out of the University of Chicago. Uh, and he actually shows that yoga is a really, really good training tool to get into uh, the flow state. And so we can actually train folks because it puts you in the right brainwave patterning and some of the key benefits of getting out of your way from a self uh, prefrontal cortex standpoint. 
And so by training that yoga stamp, we can access flow easier, which allows us to perform better uh, when we need to. And so uh, using yoga as a tool for flow, none of your listeners have ever thought of that correlation. And so uh, I wanted to bring that up as we're talking about performing optimally as human beings, because that is a state of being when we are performing our best, as, as they say in that world. And the funny thing is we all want to perform our best, uh, right. but then we look at things that are maybe a little bit more outside the box, such as yoga or TRE or whatever that looks like, and yeah. we shy away from it, right? So but totally. our goal is to be the best firefighter we can possibly be, right? So Yeah, yeah. And I work with, um, what, I work with a high-level training team down here in the United States. We do a training called Developing High Performance. From uh, the guys that wrote that book, um, they now... Uh, travel around and do these trainings. And what's fascinating is we put a bunch of firefighters in their bunker gear and they can get into all kinds of goofy working positions. And it just happens. They also end up with strains and sprains, not by accident, because I take those same firefighters and put them into a yoga class and ask them to literally get in the exact same position they were just in the fire ground. And you should hear all the grunts and the groans and the moans trying to get into it. I'm like, guys, you were just in that position in your bunker gear. What changed? Like nothing. The only thing that changed is, is that you put on your quote unquote superhero suit, uh, your bunker gear, and now you feel that little bit of invincibility and you can move everywhere you want to go. And it's by no accident that we end up with sprained knees and back issues and hip issues and shoulder issues because we're pushing our bodies way past their capacity just by putting our turnout gear on where we can actually train on the yoga mat to have higher levels of capacity so that we have fewer strains and sprains by getting comfortable in awkward working positions. Uh, it's fascinating to watch, though, again, about performing our best. If you want to perform better on the fire ground, there are trainings that you can do safely uh, to train for that training. So we like to say that we're a foundational training for the training. So whatever you're going to go and do on the, on the training ground, we can work on it uh, on the yoga mat first instead of afterwards well, like a functional exercise but turns functional out yoga fu turns yoga. out yeah yeah and so that's what makes us different than like your your local yoga teacher uh, so we are yoga for first responders so we are built a, a very specific protocol for this population and so one of the things that we really really pride ourselves on is that i'm a firefighter olivia who founded this uh she went through both the law enforcement academy and a fire academy um, solely to learn the functionalities, the body mechanics of all of the different working positions that these two professions specifically have to do, and then correlates them back directly to yoga. So everything that we do in our yoga classes have a job-specific application. So we will never ask our students to do anything that we cannot directly correlate to uh, the fire ground, for example. So um, a couple of other things that we don't do that makes us a little bit different um, is we don't use Sanskrit, um, that language that you may hear uh, in yoga studios. Um, we don't use any of that. It's kind of like how the fire service got rid of the 10 codes, or at least for the most part, it got rid of the, the 10 codes. Uh, we just use plain English. So everything that we do is in plain is in plain talk. You know, we have to worry about be feeling weird because of using some kind of strange language. Uh, we don't use music. Um, and we don't use incense or essential oils. They have both of those have their place um, and folks can use them at home. But in our classes, we don't use them um, because we're working with public safety folks and we don't know your stories. Uh, uh, one of the ones that I like to bring up is uh, lavender essential oil, for example. It, there are plenty of studies that show that lavender has a calming effect uh, on the body and nervous system. Until the car accident you ran on yesterday where three kids died and the car crashed into a lavender bush. Like that lavender is not, not so calming anymore, you know? So we are very, very intentional on what we do and how we do it so that every physical mo movement has a job-specific application. And then we really work to keep uh, the population that we're working with in that safe space so that they always feel that they're taken care of, that they don't have to take care of us or that, they, that we don't understand uh, them, kind of like a local yoga teacher coming in might. And so, but at the end of the day, we are rooted chief in traditional Hatha yoga. I mean, we were talking at the beginning that you are trained in TRE. 
And so that has a lineage to it. We're rooted in Hatha yoga that's over 5,000 years old at this point. And so we are very traditional yoga. So our protocol really falls into three categories, if I may. So we start every class uh, with tactical breath work. So breathing is the foundation of what we do. Um, I have training resource guides. I'd love to actually put a link to our PDF of our training or breathwork training resource guide in the show notes. Uh, so I, I can just... send that link to, to you if you, if you don't mind. Right, uh, yeah, because if we can control our breath, then we can control every other aspect of our body, mind, and nervous system. And so uh, with our by controlling our breath, we can control things such as our heart rate variability and our brainwave patterns, let alone just stopping a physiological response of the fight or flight response. So I want to make sure you're trained very, very specifically in breath work. Then we add on physical drills. And this is what most people assume uh, yoga to be. It's the, it's the postures that if you were to Google yoga, um, you'd see the skinny white ladies, uh, quite frankly, putting their legs, wrapping them around their head. Not us. Uh, like I said, every, every physical thing that we do is job specific uh, for what we do. So, uh, for example, we'll teach mountain pose and then mountain pose arms up. And so mountain pose is just standing basically at attention. And mountain pose arms up is basically holding a ladder up over your head. Like mm -hmm. you can make the direct correlations to, to those. The reason why we use physical drills, though, is because there are some really, really key benefits to activating the body. Um, the first one is actually I'm trying to activate a stress response in the person that I'm teaching. And the reason for that is if I can activate the stress response, then once I have you activated, I actually come back in and re-coach the breath work on top of it so that the next time your body starts to activate the stress response again, it already knows, oh, I'm under pressure, I'm under stress. I've been trained how to breathe now, and we've taught a very specific breathing technique so that it engages parasympathetic dominance and re-engages prefrontal cortex so you can have better decision-making. So as we amplify the stress response by getting into harder and harder postures, then the next time you're stressed a little bit more and more and more and more, you already fall back and trained into that breathing technique. So we use the physical drills to amplify the stress response so that I can train the breath work. Step one. The other reason why we use physical drills, and this is really kind of your world with TRE, is that there's a lot of research out there uh, that shows that our body holds on to the stress and trauma of life. And so by using physical drills, we can actually start to, we say, process the stress out rather than just sweeping it under the rug or numbing it with alcohol or a vacation or whatever it is. We actually start to process that stress out and wring it, literally wring it out of the tissues some of those unresolved stress hormones that are stuck in our bodies. And so we use the physical drills to get rid of that. So if I put somebody in high plank or push-up position long enough, they're going to start to shake and they're going to start to tremor uh, and they're going to start to realize that. And it's not necessarily that they're weak. It's just that there's something there that's literally starting to process out. And so I watch their breath work and if they're safely breathing the way I've got them, want them breathing, and they're starting to do that little bit of tremoring, we coach, yeah, hold on. Like, let the body do what it's doing here because it's actually processing stuff out. And I can see you starting to line up because this is kind of that TRE world, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to ask you about that in a moment. And then we, the final step of our protocol then um, is what we call neurological reset at the end. So um, this is the only time I use Sanskrit because everybody's heard this word in the entire world because they've read the shirt uh, that it says, I'm only here for Shavasana. Uh, Shavasana is the ending of a yoga class where you just get to quote unquote, take a nap. Yep. Uh, that's, it. that's the only time I use Sanskrit. Uh, we call it neurological reset. Uh, but where we're a little bit different is, is that we actually then drop in single point of object focus meditation. So, uh, powerful tools to gain back control of your mind um, because one of the worst things for public safety is trying to go to sleep at night let's be honest the mind just races and it just goes and just goes and so we give our first responders tools then that they can control that mind catch it and think about what they need to think about aka what we're coaching them to like just listen to the sounds in the room or just count your breath tech breaths um, simple techniques they can do on their own 
Uh, but it's important to do after we've activated them that we then teach them to regulate um, afterwards. So that's our protocol in a very okay. short, small nutshell. Uh, and because of your expertise, like when I talk about like the tremoring and the slight shaking in a in a high plank or in uh, any other any of our postures, quite frankly, if we hold them there long enough, a slight tremoring will start to happen. And I often have students say, "This feels like TRE." And well, I say, "Yes, seems like it." That's not my lane of genius. That's not my zone of genius. I've done enough research to be dangerous on it, but it is your zone of genius. And so, if I may. Can yeah. you just last expand on that just a touch for me? For sure. Well, TRE essentially is fatiguing the muscles. And when we, when we actually fatigue the muscles to get to a certain spot of shaking, that's when it, the, uh, you know, our body innately starts shaking. We are meant to shake as human beings. Sure. We are meant to, after any sort of trauma, any sense of stress, any tension, we are meant to actually physically uh, shake. So it's actually a neurogenic shake. So it's actually our nervous system is what continues the shaking. So we get to a point where we can exercise our muscles and we do this through seven exercises in TRE. Mm -hmm. And we, we do that through that. And then once we start tremoring, our body now knows that it's safe to tremor in the future. Yeah. And so that's the beauty of it where, you know, it just kind of takes over after that point. And sure. the body will neurogenically start to shake out tension, stress, trauma. So to actually go through the exercises and fatigue the muscles is just a way to, to open that gate, to allow yeah. your body to say it's safe to do. It's not really the, the, the exercise themselves. They're, you know, almost for beginners. And as you grow your practice, that, sh that tremoring, that shaking can happen without any exercises. Yeah. Uh, I can lie on the floor within 30 seconds. I could be shaking. Sure. And it's, it's an interesting kind of feeling. And actually when I teach it, I, I mentioned that it's very similar to yoga and a lot yeah. of the, the, a lot of the poses are almost like a yoga slash stretching. Yeah. Um, very simple procedure to do, but very similar to what yoga is as well. Yeah. And amazing results I've seen in it because it's actually working on the fascia and the nervous totally. system. Absolutely. Right. And that's, a, that's what at the end of the day is like, I have a lot of folks that say, oh, yoga is not for me. And I used to, I used to accept that. I really did. Cause it's like, okay, each their own, whatever, go, go find whatever makes you happy. But I've started to push back on it a little bit. Uh, because at the end of the day, what you're doing in TRE and what we're doing in yoga is actually working at a biological, like a neurological level. It's a cellular level change. And so by saying that yoga or TRE isn't for you, isn't for me, that's actually saying that you are different, biologically different than the 8 billion other people walking around on this earth. And with all due respect, Joe Firefighter, uh, if you're that special, that different, you would be in a lab being tested right now. Uh, the fact that you and I are having this conversation tells me that you're not that far off from the other 8 billion people walking around from a cellular biological level. And so if you gave yoga a real chance, or if you gave TRE a real chance, it would work for you. It will work for you because it is literally working at your cellular neurological, the foundation of your being level. I mean, it, it's, and when you learn the science behind it, it's mind blowing, right? And so I appreciate you sharing about TRE with me because it actually sounds very similar in some aspects for what we do and why we push into, uh, into that shake a little bit from our protocol specifically. Uh, because we need to process that stress out. And we even talk in our in-service training that uh, I believe it's Grossman's on combat. He talks that there's three ways for a, a mammal to reach homeostasis after an activation. And one of them, quite honestly, is shaking. Like that's the first one that, that he mentions yeah. in the book. Because if you watch, uh, there's some videos out there of, of like, a bear being tranquilized for a scientific test and then the bear starts to shake afterwards or that you see the antelope shaking after being chased by the lion like yep. and so that we teach that but because of our mind and our society it's always the toughen up man up don't cry don't shake all that kind of stuff you're weak if you do and so it kind of shuts that offline and so okay if that's offline uh, then what are the other options to actually come back to a homeostatic standpoint? And so, but it sounds like you guys are teaching me in TRE really is re 
embracing uh, that uh, mammalian shake to let the nervous system self-regulate in the moment uh, rather than bottling it up, storing it up, and hope being that we get to deal with it in the future, which let's be honest, we never do. hundred percent. And I think the other nice bonus with yoga and TRE is you can do it in your own private space. So if you don't quite feel 100% comfortable, you can do TRE, you can do yoga just by yourself. And that's going to have a huge, huge impact in your life. Uh, there's, there's great power in doing it in groups though, as well. But for those who are like on the fence of like, oh, can I do this? Or I don't want to look weak or I don't want to look sound weak. You can do it by yourself. But let me tell you, it's, it's not weak to, uh, not weak to shake, not weak to take care of your body. So 100%, 100%, quite the opposite actually. Um, and so you do hit on something else. And so we do group classes inside public safety facilities. So we don't own a yoga studio. That's one of the questions we always get is, where's your yoga studio? We don't own one. We only teach classes in public safety facilities or where they are training, uh, for example. And so um, we go to them. We have about 400 trained instructors across the country, coast to coast, border to border. Um, And so if there's somebody in the local area that uh, people are listening, um, those folks can do drop-in classes at the firehouse. You guys call them fire halls uh, up there? If I fire recall. halls, fire stations, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So that was one of those uh, cultural things that I had to learn when I started talking to a few more Canadian folks. Uh, and so the, but we go, we go to you guys. Like we go to the, we go to the public safety folks. Uh, if we don't have any teachers around, then we try to provide the resources like the breathwork uh, resource so people can at least get some basic tools. Um, we do have an app that you can download on your phone at Yoga for First Responders. Just search for that um, because of what you just said. We do have folks that will never show up to the drop-in class at the firehouse, um, but they download the app and then they use it at home uh, and they do it with their kids or something like that because they want to give it a shot, you know? Um, and they're like, oh, I actually feel better. And then then they start to get hooked to it. But it's there is incredible power actually to do it at work with your crew with those around you that you're going out and running calls with because, uh, and this is where the proactive start part of it comes in. Like we all have stories out there of like, well, we ran a bad call. That doesn't seem to affect Sally, but it affected me really bad. And we all live unique individual experiences. And so we never know what call is going to affect somebody differently. And quite frankly, it's probably not actually that call that affected somebody. It's probably the stacked up cumulative stress over the one, three, five, 10, 30 years of working, plus the 20 years of life before that. And that just happened to be the proverbial drop in the bucket. Uh, But there's so much more stacked up uh, on top of it. And so by doing these tools at work together, um, we are actually providing a proactive health and wellness tool um, that no longer makes people feel like I'm broken or I am weak or something's wrong with me. Cause, uh, we know that there's a stigma still today, even though we're talking about it and there's podcasts like this one, and we do go to conferences that if I have a mental health issue and I need to go to, uh, EAP, or if I do need my peer support team, or if I do reach out to somebody in command staff, that I'm going to be blackballed. I'm going to be shunned. I'm going to be looked down upon. I'm going to be looked at the one that's broken and weak. Uh, And so by putting these tools in place from a proactive standpoint, so we can train the mind, body, and nervous system before we need them, we're no longer associating it with being broken and weak. We're now starting to do proactive training with the people that we're working with. So we're all getting stronger and better together at work um, so that just maybe um, we may need to interact with peer support, talk therapy, those kinds of things a little less in the future because our body, mind, and nervous system are trained in the appropriate ways to deal with the inevitable stress of tomorrow. Uh, that's why I really like, honestly, the group work at the station or at the fire hall uh, because it really changes that narrative from uh, a reactive standpoint or the week I'm broken, I'm downtrodden to, oh, we're training to get better because tomorrow could be really, really hard. Just like the reason, same reason you do basic drills, the same reason you do hose drills or throw ladders so you can be better tomorrow when the call comes in. Well, if we can put training such as the TRE or our yoga first responders in the stations together in the day room where they're already doing other training, 
it's no longer weak and broken. And that's super powerful. And there's no difference than going to the gym and building big arms, right? It's you're, right. you're preparing for tomorrow. Same, <laughs> same, same thing, right? Yes. So you're yes. just, just preparing in a different way. Yeah. And because we are working at a cellular level and training our body, mind, and nervous system to uh, deal with the stress of tomorrow, because we can process the stress of yesterday. That's critically important. But our jobs are not to get rid of your stress of tomorrow. My job is to make you more prepared to deal with it uh, so that when whatever hit's going to come, because the hits are going to keep coming, that you are prepared to handle it and deal with it. And so that's where, honestly, kind of the fourth a uh, pillar of our protocol comes in. So we did talked about breath work, physical drills, and the neural reset. The fourth protocol uh, piece of it is a bit of cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is, again, where I say we're slightly different than our, your, your local yoga teacher, if not completely different than your, your local yoga teacher. Um, and so when we have folks in a stressful environment, when I see that you're starting to not breathe in a position because you are starting to shake and hold your breath and starting to think in here, I'm weak, this sucks, I don't have this. We actually come in and drop in cognitive behavioral therapy to rewire, to build a new neuroplasticity in the brain so that we start to drop in things like, I'll ask my students, is this a challenge or a threat? And then have them respond to me out loud, challenge. So even if they feel like they're under threat, they don't get the choice. They don't get the choice. Every time that I call out, is this a challenge or a threat? Their response out loud to me is challenge. Because now, yeah, because now not only am I rewiring the retraining the breath work so that when they're under stress, they've got the parasympathetic engaged, but I've also am starting to rewire the brain to think that their stress response is a challenge versus a threat. And so we've actually undergone two clinical research studies now on our protocol. Uh, one, a six-week online program during COVID, and then the other one was a 16-week in-person program uh, after COVID. And the one that we did online was fascinating. It was a small one, pilot study. I get it. For all those uh, data nerds out there, they're going to come and be like, your N was too small. Well, the N was small on purpose because it was a pilot study. Uh, but even with a small N, we found statistically significant results out of it. Because everybody who went through the program had a change in their viewpoint of stress, meaning that we changed their viewpoint of stress from being a threat response to a challenge response. And that's powerful. Like, that's a powerful thing because now when their body becomes activated or when they take the hit tomorrow, they're automatically thinking that, okay, this hits a challenge. This hits not a threat to me and my being. This is, this is a challenge that I can rise up to. And then to get into the weeds for a minute, the reason why that's critically important from a proactive mental health and wellness standpoint, and this is what was actually then shown in our second research study, is that there's a neurosteroid called DHEA. Uh, there's some new, not even new anymore. There's some good research out on DHEA. If we have, when we come under stress, uh, we all know, um, that we're going to drop cortisol and adrenaline. Those are two chemicals we've all heard at this point, but there's a third one and it's that DHEA. And so what they find out uh, is, is that if we have higher levels of DHEA in a stressful situation, it actually leads to post-traumatic growth. If we have reduced levels of DHEA in a stressful situation, it can lead to post-traumatic stress. And so that's a very key indicator when we talk about proactive health and wellness. And if we can get people to have higher levels of DHEA in stressful situations, we can tip the needle towards post-traumatic growth. And that should be mind-blowing and be like the red alarm bells should be going off in everybody's brain at this point. And so what they've shown, and this is from, uh, kind of originated with work from uh, Dr. Kelly McGonigal uh, in a book called The Upside of Stress. Good one. Uh, yep. So uh, what she showed is that the perception of the moment can change the levels of DHEA in your system. In fact, they have now set out that the only thing that really changes your DHEA levels in your system is your perception of the moment. And so if we can change our perception that the stress of tomorrow is a challenge and not a threat, we can introduce more DHEA into our system. And so by having every first responder that goes through our program 
start to associate their threat, their stress response with challenge, we can now say, because of our second study, that we are a proven proactive post-traumatic stress reduction tool. And so we actually did full randomized awesome. in-person, yeah, full randomized in-person study and showed that folks that had sub-threshold PTSD, so folks that had the symptoms but not quite bad enough to be fully diagnosed, we were able to reduce their symptomology and keep it off for up to 90 days after our, our intervention with them, uh, which is super incredible. I mean, because those are the people we want to reach, the ones that aren't fully diagnosed yet. And let's be honest, that's everybody listening to this podcast. If you are riding a fire, if you're riding a rig today, I hate to break it to you, but you have some level of post-traumatic stress. You do. It, 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 it's inevitable just with the nature of the job that we do. Yeah. And so to be able to say now, again, by changing that viewpoint of stress while under stress and building that new training in the brain through neuroplasticity, it's a powerful cocktail. And that's what gets me super excited and where I've gotten more comfortable, quite honestly, of not being on the truck. Yeah. Because as we have gotten to scientifically prove what we do, now it's a, a powerful spot to be in. So I can go in and talk to any fire chief or police chief across the country and lay this out there for them. And the vast majority still will say, it's not for me, not for my people. They'll never do it. But I have to accept that. That's fine but they know now. And so the tide is changing. Uh, it is evolving, but the fact that we get to say now that we are, and these are, this is out of literature. You can Google yoga for first responders in the literature and find these studies out in the world, which is super cool. There's a powerful, powerful sentiment. And I would assume uh, having done some research also on TRE that some similar benefits would be out there. I mean, you talked about how you want to bridge the gap from TRE to first responders, kind of like we've done with yoga and first responders. And exactly. Chief, I would imagine some similar things have to be out there on that too. Yeah, it sounds like a broken record uh, of what, <laughs> what I'm going through for sure. Right? Uh, but, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, get, getting that message through is, is, a, is a tough battle. That's the toughest part is to, to, to prove the power of TRE, to prove the power of yoga, to prove yes. the power of self-care. That's the biggest kind of hill we're climbing right now. But each day we are making headway. Each day we are making uh, new connections and and new kind of opening people's minds and eyes, right? So Totally. And it's, and we say, uh, and you've probably felt this too, and it's been hard to, quote unquote, prove it because we've been working with the subtle body, our mind and nervous system. Historically, those have been very hard to measure. I mean, we can measure how many pull-ups you could do. We can measure how fast you could run a mile. We can measure how fast you could flip tires or do your hose drills and things like that. So that's why those became the standards. Uh, but thanks to biofeedback machines, I mean, heck, everybody who's wearing an Apple watch uh, these days can get their HRV uh, numbers real time, which is phenomenal. Um, or we can put little things on our ears and use a, from a company called HeartMath and watch how fast we can put ourselves back into a coherent state. And so we can now see the things that we're working on in the subtle body, the mind, body, nervous system uh, from a data standpoint. And when we talk about, I mean, I'm sure you've heard it a million times, data-driven decision-making. We all have to have data but to drive our decisions. Okay, fine. I can now bring you literal data. I can put wearables on your firefighters and go through breathing techniques and mindful re mindfulness reframing techniques. And you can literally see real time uh, them putting themselves back in a coherent state. I can stress them out literally just by setting them in front of you, chief, no offense, but you walk through the door and some guys are going to have a physiological response. And so I can, we can see, we can see that happening. And so then I can watch that happen and then I can give them a tool. And within a matter of seconds, 30 seconds or less by breathing, instead of getting their mind right, I can watch them put them, their mind, body, nervous system back in a state of coherence and then print off that graph, hand it to the chief and say, this is why we do what we do, you know? And then it's hard to argue. It's hard to argue with it at that point. And so thank goodness for the wearables and the biofeedback machines, because those are uh, making our jobs easier, our jobs being yours and mine, uh, with okay. trying to, to move this into, into that realm of the subtle body into uh, data-driven decision-making. Um, so much so that special, some of the special forces uh, units here in the United States they're actually using some of these biofeedback machines that their operators 
have to put themselves back into a regulated state before they move on to the next drill of say an ob obstacle course. And so, and it's all timed. And so you have to put yourself into a regulated state very quickly before your green light check go on to the next one uh, to complete the drills. And so that's kind of that panacea, that next level is where we can put self-regulation uh, as a standard uh, in our training. So oh, I love it. I love it. I, I know, right? It's Super exciting. Ear to ear. <laughs> the future is bright. It, it really, really is. I'm really yep. excited about it because of the technology and the science that, that, that is backing um, everything that we do. And so that kind of drives another point of why we're a little bit different. So everything that we do is already written in the literature. It's already founded to be proven from neuroscience, from um, any a lot smarter people than me. Let's be honest. I'm a firefighter at the end of this. People with a whole lot of letters behind their names. I get dangerous because I read the books. Uh, yes. but, uh, but it's all already proven. It's all already proven. We've just taken this fascinating cocktail mixture of things and combine it all together uh, to take it out into the world to to make it work. And so, um, yeah, I hope. I love it. I yeah, hope we, that we've been able to dispel a few misconceptions about what yoga is through this. We've kind of taken a winding journey. Yeah, but. no, I think it's a, it's a natural journey through the whole thing, right? So, yeah, for myself, I use the Aura Ring uh, for yeah. biofeedback. I use my Apple Watch as well, but I also mm -hmm. um, fan of heart math for sure. So I got yeah, in fact, I've got the uh, setups and yeah, I got oh, the heart mouth, the new, uh, the newest piece right here, uh, nice. sitting next to me. So, yeah. uh, when Valuable. we just purchased those, um, I got an email, uh, from a gentleman at heart math specifically, and he reached out and he said, with a bunch of their studies on what they do. And we've historically pulled, uh, some of the research from heart math because they've done a lot of research on law enforcement officers actually, uh, yes. and works yes. with law enforcement. And so it's always been kind of nice that we had something kind of in a sister category, like kind of in alignment, but still different than what we do. But it was a, it was an easy jump for people to be like, oh, if it's if it works this way, it probably works in your methodology. Um, but that's why we ended up wanting to do the research on our specific protocol specifically rather than relying on saying, well, it's kind of like that right. over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, no, it was good to do our own research. But yeah, we use tools like this. I mean, this is an easy tool, heart math. I'm not paid by them or anything else, but uh, like a hundred bucks or so, 150 bucks tops. You, it's a little device. You attach it to your ear uh, and you can actually train putting yourself back into a coherent state. Um, and on, on our breath work guide, uh, there is um, a breath count uh, technique that we say for high performance and um, we call it coherency breath. And so uh, just knowing that we're coming close to uh, end of our time potentially here, I will give this training nugget. I always like to give a training nugget for the listeners uh, on something they can take away and do today because you don't have to roll out your yoga mat. You don't need to download the app. You don't need to do anything else. If you're this far into the podcast, thank you. <laughs> and so you deserve a training nugget. No, exactly. <laughs> and so, but, right? The, and the so funny thing are... is I use nugget as my, that's my yeah. terminology as well. Yep. So perfect. Yeah. Uh, and so, and like I said, it all comes down to the foundational breathing techniques of what we do. And so, uh, first and foremost, when we breathe, we want to really change our breathing pattern to be more down into our belly using our diaphragm. Um, there's a whole bunch of research out there why diaphragmatic breathing is how we should be breathing. Uh, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, uh, research the vagus nerve. Just type in vagus nerve into Google, hit enter, and you'll lose... I don't know, five or six weeks of your life. Uh, if you really wanted to dive down that rabbit hole. Every firefighter um, should know about the vagus nerve. They should. And it's amazing to me that they don't. Uh, and so we'll just drop, we'll just drop that out there because I know y'all are sitting at the fire hall or at the firehouse listening to this and you've got your phone in your hand. So you might as well just Google vagus nerve and go. Okay. hundred <laughs> percent. Yes. We want the diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so no matter what breath count that we use uh, when we teach breath, our different breathing techniques, it all starts with what we call a three-part breath. And so it's really easy to teach. So for those that can't see uh, what's happening on the videos, uh, you take your hands, you put them down on your waist where your belt would be if you're sitting up or down below your belly button, uh, a little bit lower than you would think. And so then as you inhale through the nose, if at all possible, you inhale and the belly pushes out. 
And as you exhale, the belly draws back in. And as you inhale, the belly pushes out. And exhale, the belly draws back in. So that's the first step of three-part breath, belly. You're going to take the right hand and put it on your rib cage, kind of where that SCBA strap kind of cuts across. A lot of folks are like, oh, I'm wearing my pack. I can't breathe as big while I'm wearing my pack. Well, use that pack as something to breathe against. Give your, because those intercostal muscles of your rib cage can actually push against the SCBA strap. It's all about changing that perception again, what we talked about. So the hand stays on the belly. Your right hand goes up on that rib cage like that SCBA strap. So now as you breathe in, the belly pushes out and then the rib cage expands second. Then as you exhale, the ribs deflate first and then the belly draws back in. Inhale, belly, ribs. Exhale, ribs deflate, belly deflates. So that's the second step. Then take the hand that's on the ribs and put it on your chest below your clavicles. And now for a full three-part breath, as you inhale, the belly pushes out, the ribs expand, the chest inflates a little bit. And then exhale, chest deflates, ribs deflate, belly deflates. Inhale, belly, ribs, chest. Exhale, chest, ribs, belly. So that's the foundation of everything we do. Three-part breath. We got there by talking about heart math and coherence. And so I'm going to give you what we our breath count for coherency breath. So it's still that three-part breath. But the count for this is you're going to inhale for a count of three. So it'd be an inhale, two, three. Hold for two at the top. Then exhale for five. So in for three, hold for two, exhale for five. So your exhale is a little bit longer than your inhale. Uh, through the belly, down into your nose, you'll activate the parasympathetic nervous system, your break system, guaranteed, unless you're that one person out of the 8 billion people that has a different physiology and you don't. So it will work. It may take some time, but for co a state of coherence, uh, this is when your mind, body, soul, nervous system, all the words you want to use are working in conjunction. And so what they show is that anywhere between five to seven breaths per minute if you want to get extremely specific, it's 6.6 .6 breaths per minute puts you in a state of coherence. So if we do our rudimentary math, in for three seconds, hold for two, out for five, that's 10 seconds, 60 seconds in a minute, guaranteed to put you in that sweet spot of five to seven breaths a minute uh, using that breath count. Uh, and then using that three-part breath, um, that's a powerful, powerful breathing technique uh, to take away and just start to practice throughout the day whenever you think about it so you're like cool. man i'm thinking about my breath maybe i should try this three in for it. three hold for two out for five yeah yeah i, I talk about it in my book uh i just learned how to breathe two years ago right that, that's the the title of the, the set. because honestly you know probably like every other first responder who's listening right now yes all up in the chest yes and i you know i i actually did heart math and that's how i found out that i was not breathing effectively Right. Very first time I use heart math. And right. after that, I was like, I've been practicing diaphragmatic breathing. Yeah. Every day. And it changes everything. And it really, really changes everything. And it think does. about it, folks. We watch how our patients, like I'm sure you guys are first response, medical response. Yes. Most yeah. our services are, right? Yeah. And so we watch how our patients breathe. We take so much information in on how they're breathing. And so how you're breathing in in part impacts every other part of your being. And so if you're not breathing correctly, just think about like if you can see when your patient's not breathing correctly. And then you start to think about, am I breathing correctly? Oh, shoot, probably not. Mm -hmm. And so I need to learn how to breathe differently. And then you get into the science of nasal breathing and how nitric oxide is more, bene more uh, potent through the nasal cavity than through your mouth. And then how that actually engages more of the parasympathetic response in breathing and through the mouth and how it works better at the blood oxygen exchange at the lower level of your lungs. And Chief, we could go on to three more episodes about just the physiology of breathing alone because that's my wheelhouse. Nice. That's what I really, really pride myself in. Um, and there's one thing that's so critical for the fire service that I think I can't leave it out since we're, since we're diving into the breathing, the, breath, the breath work uh, stuff. Uh, it's called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. And this is from, uh, founded from a physiologist named Christian Bohr uh, back in 1904. So coming up on 120 years ago, and this blows my mind that this isn't being trained in every single 
training academy across the country, quite frankly, uh, across the world. Uh, because, so what the Bohr effect shows, and this is back to uh, breathing 101, is that as uh, levels of carbon dioxide build up into our system, it's the baroreceptors in our brain that says, oh, too much carbon dioxide. We need to take a breath to bring the levels of carbon dioxide down. So it's actually carbon dioxide that's remind, giving our body the signal to breathe. But uh, for a long time, people thought that, that carbon dioxide was waste gas, useless, useless uh, gas in our body. But what that carbon dioxide actually does is it allows the blood, uh, the oxygen hemoglobin exchange to take place at the cellular level. So it actually, higher levels of carbon dioxide actually allows the oxygen to leave the blood easier to get into our tissues. Meaning that if we can live with a slightly higher level of carbon dioxide in our systems and our bodies, our muscles use that oxygen more effectively. That's critically important when you have a limited amount of air hanging off the back of your body. And so if you want to make that pack last longer, we need to be able to train to have, be able to survive and sustain ourselves with higher levels of carbon dioxide in our system. Now you go to every fire hall across Canada and every firehouse across the United States and you go in there, and as we talked about, you walk through the door, the vast majority of, the, majority of those firefighters are going to be sitting there mouth breathing. Yes, you, we make fun of them, but they will be, they will be mouth breathing. They'll be breathing high and tight into their chest. So they have dysfunctional breathing, which means they cannot perform optimally with high levels of carbon dioxide. And then they wonder why they're breathing through their packs in 5, 10, 15 minutes on a fire scene and coming out of the fire with their pack frozen to their back, even in the, in the height of summertime. And so there are breathing techniques that you can do to train your body to survive with slightly higher levels of carbon dioxide in your system. It's basically the exact opposite. I get this question a lot. The exact opposite of Wim Hof breathing. So everybody, most people are familiar with Wim Hof breathing at this point. It's where we basically hyperventilate. So we're blowing off the CO2 and then holding our breath for as long as possible. Well, that until the CO2 comes back up and then trips us to breathe again. That's not what we want to train as firefighters, quite frankly. It's good breathing technique for the reasons why it's there. But for if we want to perform optimally as firefighters, we actually have to kind of train the exact opposite. We have to train for higher levels of carbon dioxide in our system. And so this comes from a, a training methodology from a gentleman named Patrick McCowan, um, author of The Oxygen Advantage. Um, I am a book. fantastic book. book. I, am, uh, I am an Oxygen Advantage uh, certified instructor. So this is where I'm pulling from. Uh, for this part of it ties directly into, as you know, from reading Oxygen Advantage, a lot of it is traditional breathwork practices from yoga, actually, um, that we're repopularizing. And he fully admits that. Um, so the breath technique um, to train uh, your body to have higher levels of CO2 is also on this resource guide I'm going to put in the show notes, uh, is called For Increased Stamina for Firefighters. So it's very, very simple. You inhale and you exhale normally. And then you hold your breath out. And so the goal to start with is to hold out for about 10 seconds. If you've never trained in breath work and you have just highly dysfunctional breathing, don't feel bad. But I'm going to tell you, your score may be five, six, seven seconds. And that's okay. That's where you're at today. It's like any training and it can get better. And so just slowly start to work on slowing your breathing down, breathing in through your nose, inhale, exhale, hold. And then this time, try to go for a one-tenth of a second longer. And then do it again, one tenth of a second longer, and three or four rounds a day. And slowly over time, you can get that uh, number to increase. And so, um, for what Patrick McCown says is uh, good breathing, non dysfunctional breathing, you should be up in about 20 to 25 seconds on that breath hold. I'm telling you uh, and telling your listeners, don't expect to be at 20 seconds. The vast majority of us, when we start this, are honestly going to be down in five, six, seven seconds. And that's okay. It's where we're at. But over time, you can get up to around a minute on this breathing practice, on this breathing pattern. Uh, and that's kind of where elite level athletes are, um, who, as they've shown, can be at 98, 99% of VO2 max and still breathing through their nose. Uh, that's a lot. Impressive. That's a lot. A lot. <laughs> it is. It's super impressive. That's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of training. Yeah. Would not expect most of the people listening to this 
to ever get there. You may, there may be that one uh, elite person out there that's already there. Um, for the vast majority of us like me, it's going to take years of training to get to that point. Um, if ever, if ever. Uh, I, I did but, try that exercise when I read the book the first time and uh, be interesting to actually go back. I totally forget what my score was, but I do remember doing that drill. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's and that. And I, I mean, man, I want to start a, I, another hour? On another podcast. Like that's a, I want to travel the Let's country do honestly, do uh, do teaching a class on that specifically because it's so critically important uh, for firefighters to understand uh, why that CO2 is so critically important and that we can train on it. And again, just boggles my mind that that's 120 years of research sitting there on the shelf that's just sitting on the shelf collecting dust at this point. So, well, I thanks know, for right? bringing it to the, the BTH community. Totally. Thanks totally. for allowing me the platform. Yeah. I mean, honestly, this is why I love doing podcasts because they all have a different, a different audience and a different platform, a slightly different style. And totally. uh, I'll be honest, Chief, you got, uh, allowed me to take some different detours than I, than I normally get to take on these shows and talking about that personal mission statement to um, the bore effect at the end is a wide range, but I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Yeah. I think it's the, the coaching mindset that I have for this podcast, right? This podcast is, it's more than a conversation because a conversation anybody can have and they can pick up a book and read it, but there's, there's an engagement piece to this, right? But I like flow. I like it where it just naturally flows, where people listen, feel like they're involved in the conversation or right. sitting next to us. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, which, that's be honest is, which let's be honest is the biggest thing I miss from not being on the truck anymore is sitting yeah. around the, sitting around that coffee table yeah. in the day room, uh, drinking the coffee, solving, you know, this century's problems and next century's problems and half the ones from three centuries before us, you exactly. know, yeah, totally. that's the, I'll be honest. I don't miss the 2 AM board alarm. Nope, uh, neither. The, or the frequent flyer, but that's, that's the aspect that I miss, which is honestly yeah. why I love being now in this world. Cause I still get to hang out with cops and firefighters just about every single day, uh, whether it's virtually or in person. And it fills that, uh, fills that need. Uh, love a little love bit. So I'd love to hear your, your thoughts, Eric on, or maybe a message to the leadership in the fire service, yep. the leadership in all first responder agencies. What's a little nugget that you could kind of dangle in front of them to see the importance or, or just test it? Like, what do they need to know to really feel comfortable to make the decision to start a yoga program or something yeah. similar? Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's a powerful question. Uh, and the, re the answer is going to come in twofold. Number one, know that our program specifically, because we have undergone the clinical research studies, is proven to work. So you say the data matters. Uh, we've put our neck on the line to prove that what we do works uh, and it will work for your folks. Uh, these were trials done with firefighters and cops, just like yours, in person and online. Uh, and so that data is there. But the more important message, honestly, is I challenge you to get out of your own way. I challenge leadership to get out of your own way because. I reach out to fire chiefs and police, chief, police chiefs on a daily basis and hear the same answers. No, over and over and over and over again, where they get frustrated uh, that I called them the wrong title. And we're so wrapped up in the fact that I called you, I'll pick on my law enforcement brothers and sisters since they're not the ones listening to this show, that I called you uh, sheriff instead of chief or chief instead of sheriff. That just prickles their skin so much. They've lost the message of what I'm trying to tell them. Uh, and I fully admit I'm human and I make that mistake once in a while. And the fact that our leadership loses sight of what's so important for their people, or they've been told that I need to do something and so I'm going to do, we have EAP or we have other programs or we have our peer support program, right? We have, and our numbers aren't changing. In fact, they're getting worse. And so it's time as leadership in public safety world fire service, law enforcement, whatever it is, that we start to find proven tools that affect our people on the biological level. And that's the challenge I give to you because, it, and it may not be yoga, I fully admit that, but chief, you have TRE. There are other things out there 
that work on such that biological level that have the data to back it up, whether it's the aura ring, the heart math, whatever it is, we can sit in your office and work through this together. So just get out of your own way. Like give it a shot. Give it a shot. That's my message. Yep. Try it once. If it doesn't work, you, at least you said you tried it, right? So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's so frustrating. The, uh, the amount of leadership, uh, I'm going to step out on a limb, the amount of leadership that honestly is, whether it's ego driven or I'm the chief. And so it's my way or the highway or whatever it is that chest beating attitude, um, kind of that old school mentality, uh, quite frankly, um, there's no place for that in the fire service anymore. I mean, I'm going to call it as it is. There's no place for it in the agree. fire service anymore. Here, and, if here. That's, and if that's you, um, I'd say it, but you're part of the problem. Though. The dad, the evidence is out there. The evidence is there that if you're on the other side, you're now part of the problem and you owe it to your people. You owe it to your people, quite frankly. And if you, and you owe it to their families, most importantly, when we have, when we have the data to show that it can make them better husbands and wives at home, you owe it to their families yeah. at the end well, of the day. Well said. Well said. Last question. Um, for people who are kind of flip, jump the fence and they're, they're mm -hmm. game for this. They want to incorporate this into their organization. They want to, they want to make this a regular thing. Yep. What's the very first step that somebody can take to incorporate this successfully? Because a lot, you mm -hmm. know, when you incorporate change, it can tank or it can be totally. successful. So what would be one nugget of making that successful rollout? Yeah. Start small. So uh, we get a lot of people that want to change the world. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this and force it down these guys' throats and we're going to go every day. Um, I would love that, honestly. Uh, the mandated approach honestly works because people actually have to show up and actually have to do it. Sure. But uh, oftentimes it's the start small change. And so I have folks where programs and very, very big agencies, tier one agencies uh, across the country started because of one person, one person, uh, uh, Chicago Police Department mandated our program for all 12,000 of their police officers. Awesome. But it started because of one police officer and an agency of 12,000 because she believed, quite frankly, and she just kept working that chain of command over and over and over again. And so for successful imp implementation, how I, I would start with the data and the research. Start there. And we have what we call a buy-in packet that gives you the data that you can give to your commanding officer. We have a five-minute leadership briefing video because I always say, oh, I don't have enough time to listen to this. And we said, okay, well, we'll give you a, the, the gist of what we do in a five-minute YouTube video. No just yes. send, yes. send your chief to YouTube for five minutes and, and have him watch that video. Um, take the breathwork resource card. Uh, that's in the show notes uh, the, as a PDF and say, look, it's not about stretching and touching your toes. It's actually about changing how we breathe and changing our mindset around this because the misconception you're going to run against is that it's all about stretching. I don't have the yoga body. Yoga is not for me. My wife does yoga. I mean, you can, hear, you can hear that on down the line. And so the first thing that you can do is address the misconception and say, literally take that card or send your chief the card that says, no, look, it's about autonomic nervous system fitness, autonomic fitness, as we call it. It's about breathing, about making sure that our mindset is correct so we can perform our job optimally. Let's start there. And then from services that we offer as an organization, we have the app. So if you just want to try it at home on your own, we have the app that you can put in your pocket, on, uh, the app store, just search YFFR. Um, we actually have online in-service trainings. Um, so if we don't have an instructor near where you're at, um, we've done this very successfully with agencies across the country as we drop in a two hour, everybody into a two hour in-service training. So you go through uh, an hour and 15 minutes of coursework, and then you do a 45 minute uh, yoga class uh, on your own. And we've had great, great results from that. And so if that's then successful, then we work about finding somebody from the agency to come to one of our training programs to do instructor school so they can start teaching this at the firehouse. Your own people teaching yoga to your own people. I mean, that's, that's where it really starts to get powerful. Um, but you can see how you can ramp up uh, to that. So there's many, many steps uh, along that path to, to get somebody fully trained in our protocol. 
so they can teach it uh, back at work with them. But that's the that ultimately is how it becomes the most successful because then you're teaching it on duty to your crews while they're at the firehouse. And that's, that's the best solution. The, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So how can people, or is this only available in the U S or is it, are there any Canadian teachers or yeah. other no, we, countries? We have a, yeah, we have, a, actually have a few teachers, uh, in Canada. Uh, we have some in Australia. We have a few in Europe. Oh, okay. right. uh, so we are technically a worldwide nonprofit, uh, yeah. at this point, at this point. Um, but that's why we built the digital resources out as well is so that, um, if we do have, uh, somebody local, they're local to you. Great. If not, we have digital resources and then we run about three to four, three to five, uh, of our instructor schools a year across the country. Um, we've got one coming up closest to your neck of the woods, um, would probably be down in Arizona. It's a hike, but it's West coast, um, uh, next spring. Um, if you've got some folks on the East Coast, we do have one in the Washington, D.C. area uh, coming up in the summertime as well. So, um, yeah, so and then it kind of rotates, rotates throughout. Um, we actually have been into the Seattle area a few times, actually, for different instructor schools over the past few years. So we do make it up into your way uh, every couple of years. Uh, back up. So you don't have to fly so far. <laughs> uh, but well, I'll be honest. Sounds Arizona like sounds be better than Seattle, though. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> well, listen, I'll be honest. I, I think your spot sounds pretty darn nice for yeah. where you're at. And so we'll, we'll host uh, 20, I was going to say 2020, we're yeah. booked out for 2024. So 2025, we might have to come up into your neck, neck of the woods. Yeah. Sounds do good. Something up there. Sounds so, good. That'd be cool. Well, Eric, it's been a, a true honor to, to meet you for one. Uh, we connected just through the internet and uh, definitely have a lot of similarities in what we're trying to do in the fire service and the first responder world in general. Yeah, uh, taking it from a hu very human aspect versus a very logical aspect of, right. of mental health and self care. So, how can people learn more about uh, your company, uh, yeah. Yoga Shield Yoga for First Responders, and how can they get in touch with you if they want to? Yeah, great question. So, we're Yoga for First Responders on everything. Spelled out, uh, the key there is four is F O R, <laughs> not the number four. Uh, so, Yoga for First Responders on website, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of the, all the socials, uh, that's the handle, uh, me specifically, uh, feel free to reach out to me by email, uh, very easy email. Uh, it's Eric E R I C at yoga for first responders.org. Again, that's Eric E R I C at yoga for first responders.org. Uh, technically I am the president of the organization. So if you want to impact change on our organization, I guess you've got the right guy to get, reach out to. Uh, but no, it, it would be a pleasure to uh, continue to hear from you and hear from your audience. Um, and again, it's been a pleasure, Chief. Uh, I'm excited to, to continue our conversation after the podcast in the weeks and hopefully years to come because uh, the right. alignment, of, the alignment of what we're doing is uh, it's too close to not continue yeah. this this newfound yes. friendship, which is yeah. why the podcast is so powerful. It is. Yeah. I had like the connection, like what would have been the chance of you and I meeting and talking for an hour, right? Pretty slim. So, yep. Exactly. Exactly. So I appreciate uh, being, having the opportunity to be on your show and talk with your, uh, with your audience. Cause it's, awesome. uh, it's a true honor. So we appreciate like, it. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. All right, Eric, I really appreciate uh, your knowledge and your wisdom. And uh, I think I'm going to have to invite you back for some breathing uh, for first responders. Uh, that's yeah. uh, that's a whole episode in itself. So 100%. Let's do it. Let's do Fantastic. it. Fantastic. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this amazing episode with Eric. Until next time, stay well. Thank you for tuning in to Beneath the Helmet. We hope that this podcast has provided you with valuable insights into the world of firefighters' health and wellness. Remember, caring for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is crucial to achieving optimal performance. Join us next time on Beneath the Helmet for more inspiring conversations. Until then, stay well.